Oh, not to eat. They ate from the tree of knowledge, and as a result, transgression set in. Not just on Adam and Eve, when they transgressed the commandment of 217, you're going to find today that it was passed on to the human race, such as you and I. After they ate, uh, she ate and then gave to her husband in verse 6, and he ate of the forbidden tree. The eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew it. Now, it, we're talking about the eyes of the heart. We're not talking about physical eyes. We're talking about mental eyes, spiritual eyes. Their eyes, the eyes of both of them were opened, and as a result, they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin cloths or clothing, which is interesting. It wasn't body covering, it wasn't head covering, it wasn't face covering, it was loin covering. That's, that's very important to this lesson. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden, the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. That was Bible study time. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. This is the first time they ever did that. And that's because their eyes had been opened. Do what? I get that prayer. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. He wants to remind me. I, last week, I apparently forgot to have prayer. Thank you, William. I apparently didn't pay it, as, enough attention to his hand signals. <laughs> they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the, in the garden in the cool of the day, and, and, and that's an interesting statement because it reflects how they felt when they went to Bible study. It was a very, very comfortable. They were very comfortable in the presence of the Lord. And now they are no longer comfortable in the presence of the Lord. You know, you've been outside, you've worked really hard, and it's hot. And how refreshing it is to come in and uh, cool into air conditioning. In fact, it, you have to be careful because you don't want to go back on work. <laughs> All right. And they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, walking in the cool of the day, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. So the Lord God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman... <laughs> Now, uh, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. We used to call that passing the buck. <laughs> it's the blame game, isn't it? The man said to the the man said, the woman you gave. Then the Lord said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The ser <laughs> the servant deceived me. The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Everybody's passing the buck, aren't they? Everybody's blaming somebody else for their own responsible bad behavior. So guess where we got that idea from? The fall of Adam and Eve. So let's have a word of prayer. Thank you, William. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll, we'll, we'll get into a study called The Naked Truth. The Naked Truth. As a believer indwelt by the Holy Spirit, church age, if you believe that Jesus died for your sins, yours, was buried and raised on the dead third day, the moment you believe, you receive not only salvation, but the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. He takes up residence in your body, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, and your body at that moment becomes the temple of God on earth. The temple of God on earth. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. He is in your body, in your life, in John 14, 16, forever. He's not permitted to leave. 
As a result, the great ministry of the Christian life comes from the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. Again, in John 14, 26, it says the Holy Spirit is there to teach you and to recall the word of God from your soul to your life. John 14, 26. What God wants out of you is for you to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and not in the power of your flesh. Galatians 5, 16 and 17. If you don't know those verses, you'd be wise to write them. Because your entire Christian life is based out of the ministry of the third member of the Godhead, God the Holy Spirit, who lives inside your body. Now, one of the things in John 14, 26 is to teach you the word of God so that it, he can recall it to your life experience. How does that work? If you have committed sin, the Holy Spirit is not permitted to leave, you're in what's called the flesh. To get back to the ministry of the Holy Spirit who has not left you, you have to confess your sin. You do it in privacy, you do it through your priesthood, and you do it as soon as you realize you've committed a sin. It could be a mental attitude sin, a sin of the tongue, or a overt sin. You make confession of that, you name it, cite it, say what it was. In 1 John 1, 9, in 1 John 1, 9, it says, and he will forgive you and justify you and to cleanse you from that sin and return you to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's essential for Bible study. So I'm going to give you a moment to bow your head, close your eyes, uh, to do a little priesthood business with the Lord. If you have never believed the gospel of Christ, that he died for your sins, then you need to do that. You need to tell the Lord. You need to tell the Lord God, listen, I believe Jesus Christ came in the world and died for my sins so that I won't have to. And he's given me life eternal so that I can live my life over the power of sin. You need to have that discussion with him. For the rest of us, we need to confess our sin if we're aware of it. Father, we thank you. For these that have come our way to study with us, pray the Holy Spirit, as instructed in the scriptures of the New Testament, would instruct us, teach us, love upon us. The fruit of the Spirit is love. We have that first love through Christ. I just pray, Father, we would have the understanding of the importance of that work of the Holy Spirit in the hour of study and our discussion on the naked truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, here we find an interesting subject matter about the couple. I want to compare two verses. You got your Bibles? Or your phone or wherever you got? You got Genesis? Look at Genesis 2.25. This is the married, the, the, the 18 through 25 is the wedding ceremony of Adam and Eve. We get to attend the wedding ceremony of Adam and Eve. They're being married by the Lord God. In verse 25, at the end of the marriage, it says, the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Do you read that? Okay. Let's go to the third chapter and verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin covering. Verse 8, why did they do that? When the Lord showed up at Bible study, and they were supposed to be at Bible study, and they heard the sound of him walking, they hid themselves, watch this, from the presence of the Lord. What are they hiding from? The presence of the Lord God. They're hiding. Why would they hide? They never hid before. 
Were they naked before? Oh, yeah. Verse 25. Second chapter 25. They were naked and what? Not ashamed. Now, all of a sudden, they're naked and they are ashamed. And what did they cover? They covered their loins. They didn't cover their face. They didn't cover their head. They didn't cover their body. They covered their loins. What significance would that be? When you read in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, about put on the full armor of God to do warfare with Satan. He talks about the different elements of warfare that the Christian needs to be aware of and to wear daily. Right? One of them deals with the loin. Well, hold your place in Genesis because I'm not through. Let's go to Ephesians where he talks about put on the full armor of God. Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Paul is talking this and he lays out the key doctrines for the Christian that are important for warfare with against Satan. He talks about and he does it in military terms. He shows a, uni, a, a soldier decked out for warfare and describes his armor as an analogy to the Christian life of what we have to, how we battle Satan and, and beat him. So I'm in the sixth chapter of Ephesians. And this thing starts, put on the full armor of God so that you're able to stand against the schemes of the, of the devil in verse 11. Then he talks about the angelic warfare, the spiritual warfare in verse 12. Then he comes back to the, take up the full armor of God that you can be able to stand and resist in the evil day. Stand firm, therefore. Now watch, I'm in verse 14. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with what? Truth. truth. That's truth. That's absolute truth. The only place you find absolute truth is in the Bible. In the Bible. Having their, having girded their loins with truth. Right? On the full armor of God, that belt of truth is what held the sword and was a key part of the holding the armor, the rest of the armor. You put that on and then you began to attach all the rest of the armor necessary for warfare. Truth, the word of God. Jesus told him in John 8, 32, you will know the truth, absolute truth, and it will set you free. From what? The cosmic system of lies. John 8, John 8 chapter, further down in that, in verse 44 and on, he talks about the devil, whose nature is to lie. The warfare the devil attacks you with are lies and deception. The only thing that can defeat the lies of the devil is the truth of God's word. You understand that? And they got, he got Adam and Eve in the garden over it. He got them. He lied and they believed the lie rather than the truth. God said, don't eat. The day you eat, die and you will die. The devil says, you won't die. They ate of the fruit and they died. They died spiritually first, and they died physically later. 950 years later, Adam died physically. But he died spiritually while he was still in the garden because he was hiding from the presence of the Lord God. What used to excite him was the presence of God. It now horrifies him. So what has happened to Adam and Eve that would cause them to hide from the presence of God, which once was the most comfortable place for their soul to be? 
They sinned against God. If you think that your sin against God, that you've been fooled and tricked by the devil, to think that your sin that you're holding on to is going to find you some place of comfort, you have been lied to and you are deceived. God, not true. None of that's true. And you can either find that out the easy way by going to Bible study or the hard way, the, what's called the hard knocks of life. But you will be taught it. Because it's a lie, and, as, and you must not follow that kind of lie. So here is Adam and Eve, who once were naked and not ashamed, who had no shame in the presence of God being naked, nor did they have shame uh, of being naked in the presence of each other, are now ashamed of their nakedness. Right? They are now ashamed... Of their, and, and so this opens up in our study, and I've got a, I've got a few points, uh, the first hour and the second hour, to, to get through on this. The lesson will address what happened to cause such a big change in the life of these two people. And how did it get corrected? I mean, you've got problems in your life, but how are you going to get them corrected? If you don't get them corrected, listen, the devil is going to rub your nose till you don't have a nose. He's going to rub your nose into your sin until you don't have a nose and you know, you've got a face and no nose. Then he's going to keep rubbing until you don't have a face because you can't face anything. Need to face it now where you understand it is sin and the sin separates you from the presence of the dynamics of fellowship with God Almighty. Nothing good is going to come out of sin in your life no matter what you believe. And here's the story to tell you, nothing good will come out of your sin. You think it's, going to, it's good for you? It is not. Listen, it's taken poison. You're, 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 you're poisoning your soul against God. And you need to stop that foolishness. You need to, you know, you watch at the news and say, oh, wow, the world is over. Listen, you ought to pay attention. You ought to look in the mirror. And stop, the stop looking at the television complaining about how people are in sin and evil in America today. Pay attention to your own life. Look in a mirror. See where you are in your relationship with the Lord. I mean, if you're, if you're looking, if you're going to the sin route thinking that somehow that's going to correct the, your misery in life, it is going to add to your misery. Not, not, there's no solution to that except in the Lord. So Adam and Eve were naked and unashamed. They didn't have a problem standing in the presence of God or in the presence of each other. And now something has happened that they're ashamed of it all. They're hiding. They're, they're uh, miserable. They're miserable. They possessed. Now listen, this is important to you. Because they, there's, there is no sin in the world until they did this among mankind. There's none. The only person that sinned prior to this in eternity past was Satan in his revolt against God and was cast out. We didn't have any of this. They were not, they didn't have sin separation until they, they, they did it in Genesis 2.17. What they did have, and this is really important, what they did have was a special fellowship in the presence of God. What is called in theology, spiritual innocence. About the only place you can see a glimmer of that in the human race is with very young children. Right? The innocence, the only place you see that the absolute idea of the innocence is in little children. You don't see it in adults. In this story, you saw it in adults. That absolute innocence, spiritual innocence, was a natural part of the nature of Adam and Eve before they sinned. Think about that. 
But you know what? Because they did sin, the solution for them is a solution for everybody, the blood of Christ. The solution to your sin problem is not difficult. It doesn't require anything on your part but belief to get it corrected, but it does require belief. You say, and I, I hear people, they say, oh, Ron, I am so hooked on what I'm, I'm on to, I could never give this up. I agree with you in the flesh because your flesh has no... Who's ever, who's ever dictating choices in your flesh is stupid because he's bought into the lie that you can't, you, can't, you can't conquer your flesh and you can in yourself. That's why God gave you the Holy Spirit at the point of salvation. He gave you the Holy Spirit to control your flesh. You should read Galatians 5, 16 and 17. You should read that. The only power over the human flesh and sin nature is the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. That's, and that's because you live in the church age. If you lived in another age, that wouldn't be true. You live in the church age. The moment you believe, you receive the Holy Spirit of God. You need to pick up that little packet, that little thing, 50 things you receive at salvation that you can never lose in time and eternity. You need to get that and read that. At the point of salvation, God does eight great works of the Holy Spirit in your life because you're a Christian. And you need to know this stuff. The power over the flesh... The lust of the flesh is the Holy Spirit. And you have the Holy Spirit. You need to learn to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit instead of the power of the flesh. See, I don't have to teach people the power of the flesh. <laughs> I have to teach them how to correct it. You've got to change the way you think about how you walk, how you live. You've got to learn to identify yourself with the indwelling third member of the Godhead, God the Holy Spirit, who lives inside your body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. And when the devil comes knocking on your door, you tell him, the person you're looking for doesn't live at this address any longer. Huh? How about that? When he, because he's going to knock on your door because it's always been open to him. He's always been welcome at your house. Come on in, let's party. You have to say, you're not welcome at this house any longer. I'm walking in the power of the Spirit, not in the flesh. The only way Satan can have any power over your life is for you to walk in the flesh. And that's a choice you make. And the day you say no to that, at least three or four times you'll have it beat. Now why is this so hard? Hmm? Listen, it's hard because you choose not to do it. If this is a choice you have to make in your life, and your life is not going to get better, it's going to get bitter if you stay in the flesh. Your life will not get better, it will get bitter. The longer you stay in the pattern of the cycle of sin, you walk out of it, you walk in into it. Listen, you do that several times a day, and you should stop that. You don't have to do that anymore. You, but you do have to do this. That person doesn't live, live at this residence any longer. The new man in Christ is who lives at this house address now. Can you do that? Can you make those kind of choices in your life? 
Are you willing to give up what you got that's running your life, your marriage, your children? Are you willing to give up whatever it is that separates you from the dynamics of the present? Listen, when I talk about the presence of God, do you even know what I'm talking about? Do you, in your daily life, do you sense the presence of God? You should. How do, how, how do you know you should? Because he lives there in you, does he not? Does God the Holy Spirit live in your life? He does if you believe that Jesus hung on the cross for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day to give you life everlasting. The moment you believe, you receive. This is the church age. And the third member of the Godhead comes in there, and you now have the presence of God Almighty on a 724 for your entire life. <clears throat> How is it that you don't know that? Because you don't stick your head in the Word of God. I've given you tons of Scripture already right off the front burner. Did you write them down? That's because you're not serious. You know, somebody drug you in here today and, you know, and it's promised you this and promised you that. Listen, you need to understand these people had such a wonderful feeling, a wonderful concept of what it meant to be in the presence of God that when they lost it, they went nuts. I am amazed at how many Christians I meet that don't understand and don't know what it means to have the presence of God in their life. So write this down. Because apparently you don't do it on your own, so I'm going to request it of you. Write down Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Because here's what it tells you. You want to, you want to sense the presence of God, you got to pay attention to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, is he present in your life? He's there whether you know it or not. The Bible says he's there, he's there. What you need to know is how dynamic his presence is. You need to live in the presence of the dynamic person of the Holy Spirit of God. <clears throat> he's not a visitor. <clears throat> he's a resident of your house. He's not a visitor of your life. He's not a visitor. He, he's a resident. He dwells inside your body. And he is the dynamic presence of God on earth in your life. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says, the Holy Spirit has dynamic fruit for your life. And he lists nine. He lists nine fruit. Galatians 5, 22, 23. <clears throat> if, and that's, 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 he's the tree and that's the fruit. And there are nine different kinds of fruit on that one tree called the Holy Spirit. Inside your life. You don't have to create this fruit. You just have to pick it, enjoy it. Pick it and enjoy it. You don't have to do anything to earn it. Don't have anything to deserve it. It's by grace. All right. You want to look at it? Here they are. And here's how you know the dynamic presence of the Lord in your life. The presence of the Lord. Here is one way. There are many ways, but here is one way, and here is a simple way. In Galatians, I'm looking at the fifth chapter, verse 22 and 23. Here we list nine fruit, nine different fruit that come from one Holy Spirit to any believer that wants it. Right? Is he dwelling in your life? 
Oh, I told you 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What, don't you know that your bodies become the temple of God because the Holy Spirit dwells there? And that your body is no longer your own? It's been bought with Jesus on the cross? Buried and raised from the dead. Don't you know that? You do now because I told you, and I told you where it is. All right? So here, here's what you have, and when you see this, when you see this fruit work in your life, you'll understand the presence, the joy of the presence of the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Listen to this. The fruit of the Spirit, that singular fruit, and he lists nine different fruit from this one tree. The fruit of the Spirit, Holy Spirit, is love. Watch this now. When there's no other love out there. Love can be produced in your life when there's no other love to your life. Listen, does this fruit come from the inside or from the outside? Does it come from inside out or outside in? Inside out. The Holy Spirit lives in you, and the Holy Spirit produces in you, to you, and through you. Agreed? Yes, come on. You're making me, you're making me earn my lunch today. Look, I promise you, I promise you, if you'll come stay one year with me, that's going to be hard. Come stay one year with me. God will so change your life, nobody will know who you are. Because you need to know these things. These are basic theologies of, of Christianity. I'm not teaching anything out, outside. Now look, this is love to you, within you, for you. And when you find out how real this love is to other loves that you've experienced in your life, you will know the dynamics of the presence of God in the regard to love. And then you'll be able to release it to other people. And they will be amazed that when they were unloving to you, you were loving to them without any strings attached. That's a principle of grace. Then, listen, that's the word love. And then he goes to the word joy. 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 That joy of, of being at peace with yourself, peace with others, peace with God, and not something you're manufacturing that has strings attached to it. This is joy without strings attached. This is the joy of the blessings that come to your life because you're related to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will sense the power of the presence of joy. You will, you will experience, you will experience the joy even in circumstances where joy would be so far out there that you would be you would you would be afraid to hold for it. If if we could just have joy in our life, if we could have just joy in our family, joy in my my work, or joy in my I hate my job, I hate my family, I hate my parents, I hate I hate I hate. Listen, you can have the joy. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's called a fruit. And then he goes to peace. And then he goes to patience. Then he goes to kindness. Then he goes to goodness. Then he goes to faithfulness. Then he goes to gentleness. These are all supernaturally produced inside the person who has believed that Jesus died for their sins, was buried and raised from the dead. The Holy Spirit is there inside that person to embrace that person's life personally and to reflect that to others. 
It's phenomenal. And your life becomes an example. It becomes a fruit tree for other people to come. Other people want that. People want that kind of love. They want that kind of joy. They want that kind of peace that passes all understanding. And being able to be gentle in a time when you want to run somebody over with an automobile. How, what do you have to switch off from the flesh and onto the Holy Spirit? And you will find that that one, that gentleness will occur to you. It will occur within you and be reflected to others. I know that sounds like, it sounds like a pastor on drugs. I know that. I know how it sounds because the world has gone nuts. But I'm telling you something that every believer can have, and it's a choice. When the devil knocks on your door to carry your flesh down places you know it should not go, you tell him, that guy don't live here any longer. That's the old man. That is not the new man in Christ. Your life will begin to have dramatic change in it. And you will begin to sense the presence of God in your life by the way he's dealing with you personally, how he's changing you internally to be that great witness for Christ outside. So that one day, people who look at you, your life will be the mirror of Christ. I know that's a long stretch for you right now, but I'm telling you that's the truth. When Jesus was on earth in his flesh, he said such bold things as, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. That's bold. You know what, what he was saying? I am the reflection to your life. I am the reflection of God. When you look at Jesus, you see God. What Jesus is saying to you and I, he wants you to live in the power of the dynamics of the third member of the Godhead so that when people look at your life, they see Christ. They see the reflective glory of Christ in your life. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And it will bring such a place of joy to you because you know you could have never done that on your own. Never done that on your own. And you would never want to do it on your own because it's better to do it with the Lord and feel his presence and his power. Do you know what the last one on this list is? Self-control. I meet more Christians say, well, boy, I, I would like to do that, Ron, but boy, I, I've got this addiction and I, I can't give it up. Listen, that's the flesh talking. You know how, how you answer the door? I'm sorry, but that person doesn't live here any longer. There is nothing in your flesh that the Holy Spirit cannot conquer. The problem is not that you have flesh. You will have it till you die. The problem is that you don't have the will. You don't have the will. You don't have the will. And I can't tell you how sad that is. You know you could switch this off. He doesn't live here any longer. Is that hard? Is that hard to do? I'm sorry. Listen, I just bought a house recently. I get, pe I get mail of the people who used to live there. Right? And I suppose somebody bought my house is getting out of my mail you know, <laughs> until it gets switched over. You don't live here any longer. That guy... He don't live here anymore. He doesn't live here anymore. Have you got the courage to do that today? 
Instead of bailing out on your marriage, bailing out on your work, bailing out, bailing out, bailing out, what in the world does that mean except failure? I understand you, you, you came today and didn't have the power to conquer anything in your life, but I'm telling you, you do. If you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Godhead, living inside your body and has, has already made changes on your life. And he wants you to participate in these changes. He's already changed your body into a temple. Because he put the Holy Spirit there the moment you believe the gospel. He put the Holy Spirit. And listen, I wasn't, I didn't come into this world through the Virgin Mary. I came through there through Adamic man. And I know what I'm talking about. I was well rooted in my flesh and my desires when I got saved at 23. I'm telling you what I know to be true, not just what is true in the Bible. I'm telling you that I've personally experienced this stuff. It's amazing. Why wouldn't you see and, and, and participate as a spectator and watch God do just impossible things that you could have never done. You could have never said no to that. You could have never done that, not in a million years, because you never turned it over to God. He's got to learn to turn this stuff over to God. That guy doesn't live here anymore. I told you that man don't live here any longer. The new man in Christ lives here. I want to live by the power of the Holy Spirit. So what happens if I commit a sin? The Holy Spirit doesn't leave me. John 14, 16 says he's not permitted to. When he takes up residence, he has to stay forever. You got to learn. That man don't live here anymore. That woman doesn't live at this address anymore. I'm a new man in Christ. If any man, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, how do I get in Christ? The moment I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm baptized by the Holy Spirit into a position in Christ. I receive 20 status privileges of Jesus Christ at that moment. I can never lose time in eternity. They're called positional sanctification. Did you know that? You need to pick up that little pamphlet. You need to go to our website. There's more information on our website than you could, ever, you could ever read and learn from in five lifetimes. If you believe the gospel, you have the Holy Spirit. But you got to believe that Jesus died for your sins. Look, you know what's wonderful? The moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day, your name gets sealed into the book of life, the Lamb's book of life. You should read Revelation, the 20th chapter, 14 and 15, because your name is there. And when you physically die... Your name remains in the book of life because you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is sealed by the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 1, 13 and 40 and 430. Ephesians 1, 13 and 430. You are sealed unto the day of redemption. That is the Lord return and you go or you die and be in the presence of the Lord. Do you know the moment you believe the gospel, your name is sealed by the blood of Christ through the ministry of the Holy Spirit into the book of life. In the chapter 20 of Revelation and the 14th and 15th chapters, one day you will stand and Jesus Christ will be your advocate, your defense, that you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and you will not be thrown into the lake of fire. You should read that stuff. Because it shows you the awesomeness, the awesomeness of God's love.
that would come to your life. Well, we're going to take a break. The men are going to take an offering. If you're a visitor, this, this meal's been paid for. This is for our home people. We're going to take a 15-minute break. Then I'm going to come back. I'm going to finish my study. We have read 7 through 13 and discussed some. We actually got halfway through verse 1, uh, point 1. Um, what is interesting to me is that when Adam and Eve ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it's called a transgression. A transgression. Now we refer to it as a sin, but the Bible referred to it as a transgression because of this reason. Genesis 2.17, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In the day you eat, dying you will die. In the Hebrew, they doubled up the, the Hebrew word muth, M-U-T-H, and they put it in a special dynamic of Hebrew grammar that makes this an absolute statement of dying two deaths. A spiritual death first and a physical death second. And we, in the first hour, we talked about their status that they had before they sinned, ate, ate of the tree, which is called a transgression because it's a commandment. They transgressed what was known as a commandment. They only had one commandment in the Garden of Eden. Don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. All right? So, their condition before they sinned by eating or the transgression was spiritual innocence. We talked about that in the first hour the only place you see that in human life today is in the very young. Little, very young little children have a sense of innocence. They, as adults, had it in every category of their life. And so in theology, we call that spiritual innocence. And if you'll go to the book of Romans with me for a moment, I want to show you what Paul did with Genesis, this Genesis story in the fifth chapter of Romans, beginning with verse 12 and going through 21, Paul lays it out. I just want to do the highlights of it to you. Paul is in a discussion on justification. Justification is a clue that some, there has been some kind of transgression that's going to require justice and justification. That a transgression has been made legally that's going to require justice and justification. And Paul gets into that subject. If you have a study Bible, Probably the fifth chapter of Romans is titled in some way justification. Do you have a study Bible? Does it, like for example, mine says the results of justification. That's the title of the fifth chapter. I want you to drop down to verse 12 with me in Paul's discussion. And I'm going to read through here and pay attention just to the word justification. Uh, pay attention to the word, pay attention to two words. Pay attention to the word transgression and either justice, justified, or justification, something of that nature. I'm going to read it. and You just pay attention. Pay attention to the number of times the word transgression is used for Adam and Eve's sin. Therefore, just as through one man, Adam, sin entered into the world and death through sin, that spiritual death and physical death, and so death spread to all men, for all have sinned in Adam. 
For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Never the, see, they had one. It was called the commandment, Genesis 2.17, don't eat, and the day, the day you eat, right? They had one. But th then he, from there on, to, he says from there on, nevertheless, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, till the law, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him, who is to come. Now, they didn't, nobody, nobody else ate from the tree because they were kicked out of the garden, right? Yeah, nobody ate more there. Now, watch this. Now he's, going to get in, now he's going to get into theology. The free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one, Adam, many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. The gift, he's talking about salvation now. The gift is not like that which comes through the one man who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from the one transgression resulting in condemnation. That's why you have to have justification. Because in Adam, we're all condemned. We're under the sin-death penalty. Judgment arose from the one transgression resulting in condemnation, but on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. You're under condemnation. Only, 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 the only solution to it is justification. For if by the transgression of the one, Adam, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through one, Jesus Christ. So then, he's saying, now how can we, what conclusion can we draw? So then as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men or mankind, even so through one act of righteousness, that's Christ on the cross, dying, buried, and raised from the dead, there resulted justification of life to all men. All who believe that Christ died for their sins, was buried, and raised from the dead, get saved. If you get saved, your condemnation is removed. Condemnation is re transgression. Condemnation is removed. And, and justification and eternal life is given. You see that? that you see the swap out? As for as through the one man's disobedience, Genesis 2.17, the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, Jesus Christ, many were made righteous. The law came in so that the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounds even more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace should reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, and Paul goes on to discuss it, a lot of this in other writings that he has. But Romans, the fifth chapter, is dynamite. And what he refers to as Adam and Eve, he calls it the transgression upon all mankind. Through one Adam, through one man Adam, this transgression, condemnation, judgment fell upon mankind under the sin-death penalty. And Jesus Christ came, died on that cross, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day to give us justice and justification, condemnation removed, justification put in its place. We are justified in Christ. I mean, this is great. This is the great theology of the Apostle Paul. We are justified in Christ. We are, we are made righteous, 2 Corinthians 5.21. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. So when we believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, condemnation, 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin that's upon mankind, judicial charges. You should get that little pamphlet, 50 things, and read that. Are removed, gone. In their place is justification. We are justified by faith in Christ. We are justified. 
And we hold a position in Christ as absolute righteous. In, in fact, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. He's a new creation. And you should pay attention to the word new that's used to Christians. Read the New Testament with the word new, N-E-W, and you'll see all that you get in the package of salvation. For example, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things, yeah, old things have passed away. Behold, everything becomes new. Right? So, that's a great study for you, though. It's a great study for you as a believer in Christ. And so, under point one, we have been, we have been talking about that when we took a break, uh, the Muth Muth deal. And also, it's interesting about Eve. Paul talks about Eve in 1 Timothy. In 1 Timothy, her her involvement in the fall. In 1 Timothy 2.14, listen to how Paul describes this. It was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived, watch this, fell into the transgression. When did the transgression take place? When Adam ate of the tree. How did you fall into transgression? Right? Oh, that woman. How did you fall into transgression? You were born in it. You were born into transgression. You were born under the sin death of Adam. What? All right. Yeah. That's why we're in Bible study, right? Look at this. Go to 1 Corinthians. Show you two things. Go, let's go to 15. 1 Corinthians 15. You, you know, you, have a, you, have, you deserve a right to know. Look at 15.22. For in Adam, all what? <laughs> it's good to have Horton back in class. It's good to have you back in class, my buddy. <laughs> I love you. I better say in Christ. My, people might get the wrong opinion today. For is in Adam, in Adam, we're all born in Adam, therefore we're all born what? Spiritually dead. Spiritually dead. I mean, you're physically alive, so that's not it. <laughs> you're spiritually dead, separated from God. Not because of anything you did, but how you were born. Isn't that interesting? Well, it should be. I'm trying to make it interesting. So also in Christ, that in Adam, now I'm in Christ. Also in Christ, all will be made of what? Alive. In Adam, we're all spiritually dead. In Christ, we're all spiritually alive. Now the question is, how do I get from Adam into Christ. <laughs> yes, it's true. Write this down. Colossians 1.13. Colossians 1.13. It says that all mankind born in Adam is born in the slave market of sin in the domain of darkness. Well, let me read it for you. I love to hear pages turn I can't hear the cell phones do it. But I'm old school and I love to hear pages. I'm, the, I'm a guy who likes to smell books. Is that weird? It's a little weird, eh? Yeah, Ethan says I'm a little weird about that. Uh, just about that, though, Ethan. 113. Watch this. Talking about Jesus Christ goes on a cross, buried and raised from the dead. He rescues us he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son. Now watch this. Over here you got a circle called the domain of darkness that Satan rules. And you're born in that. Over on this side, you have a circle in Christ. 
You're either in Adam or in Christ, right? Was there a third place to be? No. No. You say, why is that? I said that one day to kids, and kids are really smart. Uh, they said in church. <laughs> they say, they, I don't know about everybody else, but I'm in church. I don't know about where Adam and all this stuff is, but I'm in church. I don't know, well, you're a pretty good place to be. So here's what, in between those two circles, you put Christ dies on a cross, is buried and raised from the dead. You know, that's our way of doing it. Cross, down, up. Death, burial, and resurrection. Watch this now. Here's what Paul says. When you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins personally. You know, Christ died for Ron, whether, whether anybody else believes it or not. Isn't that something? That got to me uh, and caused, my, caused me to believe more seriously about this thing of salvation. Well, anyhow. So, the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, watch what he does now. You could take a line from the cross and draw, loop it over to the first circle, the domain of darkness, and you know what it says? It says, when you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, he rescues you from the domain of darkness. That's a, P, that's a POW rescue mission. You're in the slave market of Adamic sin, and you can't get out. You cannot get out of that. You're in the transgression of condemnation, and you cannot get out of that. And so God sent a grace way. He sent His Son to go to the cross, to die in your place, to get you the privilege out of there. When you believe it, He reaches over and rescues you and transfers you over to the kingdom of the beloved Son. You're in one of these two kingdoms. You're either in the kingdom of darkness or you're in the kingdom of light. I'm going to read that again. I'm going to read that again. 113. For he rescued us from the domain, the kingdom of darkness, and transferred us into the kingdom of the beloved Son. That's grace. We are saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves as a gift of God. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, you should be so thankful every day. You should be thankful so, so much every day. Now, he, he, watch this in the story of Adam and Eve back to the third chapter. I'm at point two. As soon as they ate and, and entered into transgression, right? They ate and became, they entered into transgression. The moment they moved into transgression, they became aware of their loss of spiritual innocence. Their eyes were opened and they knew they had been duped by the devil and they both admitted it. They had been duped by the devil. Genesis 3.13, 2 Corinthians 11.3, again talking to Eve about it. The loss of their spiritual innocence is seen in their awareness. <clears throat> Listen to me now, write this word down, consciousness. One of the apertures of the human soul made in the image according to the likeness of God is consciousness. Consciousness, conscience, mentality, volition, and emotion is a makeup of the human soul biblically. Consciousness is the awareness of yourself, the awareness of God, the awareness of your surroundings, the awareness of other people, i.e. I, consciousness. All of a sudden, they became conscious. That's really important. They became conscious they became consciously aware of their nakedness. They did not have that in Genesis 2.20. They were married. They, did, they were naked and not ashamed in Genesis 2.25. They're naked and ashamed in the presence of God before they weren't naked. They were naked, not afraid, were not ashamed of the presence of God in the cool of the day. Now they are. They're ashamed. Where'd that come from? Listen to me. Came, out, came from the loss of spiritual innocence. They were married. 
in Genesis 2.25. They were in spiritual innocence. They were naked and unashamed. In the third chapter, verse 7 and 8, they are still naked. Now they're ashamed. And they have all kinds of guilt. They have all kinds of problems with it. They are now aware, consciousness, they are now aware of their nakedness, their shame, their guilt, and their separation from the presence of God, which we talked about in the first hour. Here's how, if you were talking to them, here's how they would talk to you. They would talk to you this way. About being uncomfortable in the presence of God. Hiding from the presence of God. Not, not to want to be there anymore. Listen to what I, I think they would say. I have never felt this way before in my life. I have never felt this way before in my life. What is going on? Well, you just got separated. Right? That's, that, that's the consequences of transgression, of the eating from the tree. I told you not to eat. And their eyes have gotten over, opened in their consciousness to see what it, how, how they had been duped by the devil. And look at the things that they saw about themselves. They said in the eighth verse of chapter 3 of Genesis, they heard the sound. Not only, not only, listen, not only were their eyes open, but their ears were open now. You got that? You know what the eyes and the ears are? Listen, they're systems of perception. Systems of perception in your life are good things. It depends on where you put them, how, how, you, how you route route the information. It could be, in, and listen, it's basic, basically three I. It could be empiricism, it could be rationalism, or it could be faith. Now, if you're a thinking person, you know what I just said. If you pay attention to your life. I heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. That's Bible study. That's where, that's where we talked about the comfort of the day. At Bible study is where they were most comfortable and enjoyed one another. And the man and his wife hid themselves now from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Point number three. The Lord used four interrogative inter interrogation questions. Now watch it. This is really interesting to me. Now, we've just stepped into a court of law. They've committed to transgression, and now we're at court. A transgression. We're at court. And, he asked, and he's interrogating. And he does it with questions. Listen, if you study the life of Christ in his ministry, he did the same thing. He was a master of questions. Listen to the four in, uh, interrogative questions in order to get them to address their sin problems. The first three addressed it to Adam and only one to the woman. He said to Adam, where are you? Now, do you suppose God knows where they are? Uh -huh. Do you suppose they know where they are? That's exactly what he said. That's exactly. That's it. You're absolutely right. He jumped, he, Horton jumped the gun on him. That shows a Bible student. What he actually asked was a rhetorical question. Why are you, where are you, why are you there? Is what he asked. You're absolutely right. He wanted more than just where are you. Like I, I was leading you there and Horton got me. Got ahead of me. Where are you? Where are you? Where? Why are you where you are? Is what he's after. In verse eleven a, he asked, "Who told you that you were naked?" And that's an interesting question, because in ver in the second chapter, verse twenty five, when they got married, they were naked and what? Now they're naked and 
Well, I've, well, yeah, well, God, when he, when he interrupted their, their life of sin, shamed them. Who told you we're naked? In the same verse, part B, he asked another question. Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? You know what? <laughs> That's a simple yes or no. Do you think he's going to get a simple yes or no? I mean, when your hand is caught in a cookie jar, and Ronnie, is your hand in the is your hand in the cookie jar? Uh, oh, I don't know. It's how we hate to give up stuff like this. How quick can God deal with you if you'll be honest with Him? How quickly He can He can maneuver into your life and make great changes. The more honest you are with Him about what's going on in your life, the quicker you can get your stuff fixed. The longer you drag this out and lie about it and do this and do that, and give them all your excuses, lie and all that, it just it it says it, it, even God has gone to sleep on you. So a simple yes or no, and he couldn't get it, would work. He asked Eve in verse 13, he asked Eve, ask her one question. What is this that you have done? You know what he's after? Motive. He asked Adam where, he asked Adam who, and then he asked, he asked Adam, give me a yes or a no. How do you plead? And then he, Adam wanted to argue about what plead needed. And you know, you're in trouble. But when he addressed Eve, he said, what is this that you have done? He's looking for motive. And she told him. The serpent deceived me. And I had been good. Why couldn't we get to that quicker? <laughs> I don't know. Why can't we get it quicker to your life? How come we can't deal with sin in your life quicker? How come we have to drag this out week after week after week, month after month, year after year? How come we have to drag it out? Why can't you just confess it out? They are called to give a defense for the violation of the commandment of Genesis 2.17. Now, if you learn nothing else today, get this one down. If you're a believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ, now listen to me, this is so important in your life. You have a defense attorney that stands on behalf of your judgment anytime you're called into question. He's called our advocate. In 1 John 2, 1, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. You know what's interesting about this word advocate? Let's see. Ethan, did we talk about that, Sam? Ethan brought this up. As a good student, he is. That word advocate here is the same one that's mentioned in, in John when referring to the Holy Spirit is our advocate, our comforter. It's parakletos. It's the same Greek word used in a, yes, a defense attorney. Yeah. In this regard, it is used that way. It's just interesting. As a church age believer, we have a defense attorney to always speak out on our behalf. But somebody go, hey, the center, he just did this and he's done that. He said, well, look. I'd say to that guy, do you believe that Christ died for your sins? Very right? Yes, I believe that. Are you? Have you gotten yourself into some sin? Yes, I have. Do you know how to get out of that? You know how to clean that mess up? How? Let Christ do it. You can't do it yourself. Let Christ do it. How will he do it? He, that's what he died on the cross to do. Take care of your sin. What do I have to do as a believer? I have to confess it. I have to 1 John 1, 9 that. If I confess, he is faithful and just forgiven to cleanse. That word cleanse in verse 9 goes back to verse 7. The work that Christ does on the cross is to deal with sin, both from the Adamic side, transgression, and from the personal side, personal sin, sanctification. 
See, when you're confessing your sin, it's about sanctification. 1 John 1 9 is about restoring you to, to sanctification, to the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. Are you getting this? Are you getting it? He writes in 1 John 2 1 on your paper, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So the Lord God in Genesis is giving them an opportunity to choose to confess their guilt of sin, of transgression, and to choose the way back into fellowship with the Lord God on the basis of grace and not self-righteous works. Romans 3.20, because of the work of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. You don't get back into fellowship by doing good works. Well, I'll work harder for God and he'll forgive me. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. It is the blood of Christ that you go to. If you confess your sin, the blood of Christ continues cleansing you. It's always the blood of Christ. What will wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's true with Adamic sin. It's true with personal sin. One is for salvation. One is for sanctification. One is for justification. One is for sanctification. You need to, you need to know this. They are hiding from the presence of God. That's the worst thing you can do in your life. And listen, you know when you're hiding. Right? Don't play hide and go seek with God because His eyes always know where you are. Well, that's Proverbs 15, 3. Or 13 or whatever's on your paper. And why would you hide? Why would you hide? It's an impossible, it's an impossible task, right? You can never hide from God. Well, I'll go to a different church. Oh, I'll go to a different guy. I'll go to a different this. I'll go to a different that. Well, so what? God ain't going to be there. God is everywhere. Did you know that? Here's the issue. Listen, here's the issue. Now can you hide from God? Listen, it's not, the issue is not to hide from God. The issue is to come, come clean with God. Come clean with Him. He wants you to address your problem as you understand it, and let him take care of it by grace through faith, and not of yourself is a gift. My, 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 people. We've got to do this stuff. We have got to learn to do that. It, not by works of the law of the flesh. No. No. It's through the, it's through the knowledge that we can't do it through the flesh that we become knowledge, that it's the knowledge of sin. The knowledge of sin. He says, being justified as a gift by His grace through redemption. Redemption. That's one of the nine works of the, of the blood of Christ from the cross to the, to the Christian life. Nine works that bring you into the presence or communion with God. Fellowship with God. Redemption is one of them. Reconciliation, justification, propitiation, sanctification. These are all things that the blood of Christ Secures for us on the basis of grace. You don't earn them, you don't deserve them, but you do have them. You have access in them. Let me close. I'm close. I'm close to closing. I saw my time. Notice that they notice that watch this now, because here's the here's the preaching dilemma that we all have as pastors. Notice that they are not volunteering any information to confess. Did you notice that? Watch his questioning. They're not giving them anything. Well, what about this? Oh, I don't know. What about this? <laughs> what about this? <laughs> They're not volunteering any confession of sin. 
The Lord God, however, is patiently dragging it out of them. Do you think he's going to quit because he asked you four questions? I mean, if he's got to ask you a hundred, he's willing to do it. He'll ask you four today and four tomorrow and four tonight while you're asleep. He'll wake up in the middle of the night and go like, hey, we need to get something done about this. Listen, if, if you live in the presence of God, you can sleep, sleep in the presence of God. Did you not know that? Does he not wake you up once in a while and go like, hey, 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 hey. I don't, know. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Here's listen to David's confession. This is the Bathsheba deal. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. In other words, is this actually true in the reality of his life? Did did he do this to other people? Oh, yeah. But you know what he understood that you and I need to understand? You go to God first. You take care of it with God first, and then you take care of it with people, second, third, and fourth. Because you're going to need every bit of God you can get when you go to the household of the other person and say, I need to rectify some things. I don't know. I don't know. Just talking about David here. Let's pick on David a while. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you when you speak and blameless when you judge. I'm talking about God. I mean, you listen, you gotta come clean with God. You gotta quit this foolishness. Huh. By the time, it, the, the time your sin mess gets to somebody else's ears, it should have been already taken care of with God. Are those not the ears most important to hear your stuff? Listen, the simplicity of the Lord God's questioning of these two guys, of these two people, show his patience that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. It shows God's patience. Second Peter 3 9, God is long suffering towards us. And so he is. But listen, you need to do it when he's got you on easy street working with you, not on the tough time. You need to read Hebrews, the 12th chapter, sometime about 5 through 11, and God talks about disciplining you. And there's a light discipline to catch your attention, then a more severe, and the more it goes, the tougher it gets. You need to pay attention to that stuff. Because God deals with you as a child. He's your heavenly Father that loves you more than anything in this world, with the exception of His Son. And he loves you through Christ as his son or daughter. Man, you need to come clean with God. You need to come clean with God. Stop this foolishness and, and get back with the program. Second Corinthians eleven three. In talking to Eve, watch watch this. I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve. By his craftiness, watch this, watch the attack. Your mind will be led astray. From, watch this now. From the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. This is not difficult for you. This is not difficult. This is very simple, but you got to do it. Say, it's simple. The simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Why would you not do that? Why do you keep dragging this stuff and dragging it out in your family and your relationships and all that? Why, why would you keep doing that? As a result of Adam's transgression of Genesis 2.17, Adam and Eve are now operating, watch this now, under, under the influence of an old sin nature and not just volition. When they were in a state of spiritual innocence, 
all they had was volition, the choice, free will. Now, why are they doing all this stuff? Why are they in a works program? <laughs> are they in a works program? I mean, they're covering up with fig leaves and doing, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, the whole covering up of the, the loins of the, that is, is a, was an attack on their marriage. And it was attack on truth, right? The belt of what? Truth. That's why I called my subject today naked truth. God just wants to get to the naked truth. The naked truth. Come clean. He wants the naked truth. As fallen man, they both attempted to resolve the guilt of the transgression by covering the works of the law. By covering themselves with the words of the Lord. They sewed fig leaves together to hide their shamefulness and sinful failure as a married couple. Job 31.33 refers to this very incident when he says, Have I covered my transgression like Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom in secrecy? Adam was right to believe his sin had to be covered in order to have fellowship with God. Adam was wrong to believe that anything would work if it was given with good intentions. Good intentions will send you to hell. This is the story of Cain and Abel. Good intentions. Psalms 32.1, how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. The only thing that covers sin, my dear heart, is the blood of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9.22. Well, thanks for coming. <laughs>